just out of curiosity, would anyone else on the panel like to talk to that question, which I think we haven't quite discussed, which is how emblematic is Trump of a structural change in the United States? Or is he this kind of shocking interlude that was an accident and, and then we'll go back to something different, but not so different? Did that, that's any, Ross, do you, do you want to? I would say probably frame it not as he being the structural change, but as many structural changes happening in the United States and he becoming kind of a symptom of them. So as I mentioned earlier, right, so very stagnant economic and wage growth in many parts of the country, uh, a deindustrialization across uh, many parts of the country, uh, a lot of uh, internal mi or migration into the country and then out migration for many communities. So I, I use a personal example. I have 16 first cousins on, on um, both sides of the family um, and from the Midwest, all from Ohio and Wisconsin and all born in the Midwest. Only four of them still live in the Midwest. Um, and that happened in one generation. Um, and that kind of hollowing out of the Midwest, the heartland, the hollowing out of the middle class, has been going on for 20 years in the United States. It just didn't seem to ever percolate up. And I think the US you know, leadership, and this is both Democrats and Republicans, have really not explained well the benefits of integration, of openness. So I guess I could disagree a little bit with some of the people on the pattern who think Ameri American voters are going to be very smart and understand you know, why we should be engaged internationally. I actually am not quite sure about that. I don't think we've done a great job of explaining the benefits um, to the average American voter. Um, and as a consequence, I think you know, there's a lot of doubts about what the benefits for American leadership are if you're in like Canton or Toledo, Ohio. Uh, so I, I do okay. wonder. Thank you. Michael, did you want to say something? I think both. Um I think both points are correct. I think clearly something was happening before Trump. That's the point I was trying to make. A lot of people observed that President Obama was more interested in build, building the nation at home than building the, the order abroad. But what is different about President Trump is that he's not, uh, he doesn't, whereas Mr. Obama had a sort of a cool analytical view that the US role in the world was changing, um, President Obama is active, President Trump is acti actually actively hostile to that role. It's not that he doesn't feel they can sustain it anymore. He feels that America has been, um, has been a schmuck. Mm -hmm. That he does, you know, the, the, the current leader of the free world doesn't believe in the free world and he doesn't want to lead it. He doesn't think that it's in America's interests to, um, to, to lead in a way. He, he believes much more in the brutal application of superior negotiating power in a dog-eat-dog, zero-sum sort of way. So I think that's, a, that's an important change. The second point to make is that can the system, can America go back to what it was after four years of Trump or after eight years of Trump? And I think the jury is out on that because we already see in public opinion polls that Mr. Trump is changing the views of Republicans, for example, about alliances, about uh, trade, and yeah. about other issues like about that. About Russia. About Russia. And I don't think those views are going to snap back easily. Um, the third point I'd make, and, and I say this as someone from the Asia Pacific, is that um, I think there are real questions about the future of both the United States and China. And this is why it's such a discombobulating uh, moment. Uh, we, we're talking about Mr. Trump, but equally on the, on the China side, we don't know how China, China, there is a bipolarity to Chinese behaviour, sometimes very skillful, sometimes very hard and forward leaning. Uh, and we don't know the, how the contours of this relationship will work, whether the current uneasy competition will slide into uh, actual confrontation, which will be deeply uncomfortable for all of us. So a country like Australia worries both about a feckless America, which is what we're talking about, but also about a potentially reckless China Good. in the future. So I think you have to keep, I think you have to be aware of uncertainty in both those polls. Right. 
I mean, some people even suggest that you know, Trump understands the structural change and is taking one of the last moments of real American hegemony to push outside the multilateral system to get better deals mm. from, from inside it because mm. America's power is slowly declining inevitably compared to China and A Asia. Ichiro, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I am a believer of the uh, United States coming back, uh, like uh, Ministre Vetrin said, uh, ils reviendront d'un jour. Uh, but uh, how soon it is, uh, I, I don't know, of course, but I think it can be a temporary phenomenon. If I sound cynical, I'm sorry, but the uh, weakness of uh, intelligent anal analysts is that uh, you take what it is as something that should have happened. Three years ago, no one was saying that the Trump will win and Americans will change like this. Now, a lot of people are saying, Trump is a phenomenon. This had to happen. And I don't really believe in that kind of logic. Sorry to be very straightforward. And uh, I think maybe Mr. Trump denies values of your founding fathers, uh, democracy, f uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom and everything. But I think still a lot of Americans believe that. And that's why Mr. President doesn't have more than 40% uh, support. And so I still believe in that. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, but right. I feel, right, feel right, that right. way. No, but it is true. It's always easier to reinterpret the past.